This video is part 3 of high performance driving. In this video, I will explain centripetal force, weight distribution, how to overcome understeer and oversteer. Counter steer, how to use an engine map, left foot braking, pitching and rolling. The purpose of high performance driving, the principle of weight transfer and the principle of the friction circle and ellipse have been explained in the previous video number E0060. And the principles of spin and sliding, linear and angular momentum and finally energy conservation law have been explained in the previous video number E0061. I have a quiz for you. Which of the following statements about left foot braking is not correct? By dividing the rolls of both feet, pedal input becomes more accurate. Smooth weight transfer is possible. The time to raise engine RPM can be reduced. Acceleration is possible with avoiding turbo lag. There is no negative effect the powertrain system at all. You can pick one of these. Before getting in the main topics, it is necessary to explain the expression of the friction circle related to the slip angle, which will be frequently encountered in the future. To avoid sign complexity, all physical quantities refer to their absolute values, unless specifically stated in the explanation. In the picture here, point A and point B have the same amount of lateral force, but they have different friction circles. Let's find out why. The operating state at point A is as shown in the picture on the right, and the corresponding friction circle is a blue circle. As you can see, this is before the maximum friction force M is reached, so extra friction force is secured. The radius of the friction circle at point A in the operating state is RA. On the other hand, the operating state at point B has passed the maximum friction force M, and the slip angle has increased significantly, so it is on the circumference of the friction circle. The friction circle has been reduced to a red circle, and there is no available friction force at all. The radius of the friction circle at point B is RB. The radius of the friction circle at point D in the driving state is RD, which is outside the purple friction circle. The driving state D means that the lateral sliding is accelerated by a force of magnitude FD outside the friction circle RD. Let's learn about tire load sensitivity. According to the classical friction theory, the coefficient of friction between two objects is constant, and as the normal load increases, the horizontal load increases linearly, as shown in the figure on the left. However, tires do not follow this same theory. The tire friction coefficient mu is a function of the normal load W, and the lateral force F, Y is a function of the friction coefficient mu and the normal load W. As shown in the figure on the right, the increase in the lateral force F, Y gradually decreases as the normal load W increases, and the increase rate of the horizontal force F, Y is smaller than the increase rate of the normal load. In this way, as the normal load of the tire increases, the friction coefficient of the tire decreases, and the increase rate of the lateral force F, Y becomes smaller than the increase rate of the normal load W. This nonlinear phenomenon is called tire load sensitivity. Understanding tire load sensitivity is critical to tuning your vehicle suspension. Tire load sensitivity provides much of the theoretical background in suspension tuning. First, let's look at the relationship between the normal load of the tire and the friction coefficient. If you measure the friction coefficient while increasing the normal load on the tire, you will see that the friction coefficient decreases as the normal load increases. It can be seen that the friction coefficient does not increase in proportion to the increase in the normal load, but decreases as the normal load increases. For example, as shown in the figure, delta mu1 is the decrease in friction coefficient when the normal load increases by 1 kN from 4 kN to 5 kN. Meanwhile, delta mu2 is the decrease in friction coefficient when the normal load increases by 1 kN, from 5 kN to 6 kN. Here, delta mu2 is slightly larger than delta mu1, but has almost the same value. Thus, it can be seen that as the normal load increases by a constant rate, 
the corresponding coefficient of friction decreases by a slightly larger but approximately the same rate. The numbers shown here cannot apply to all tires and are given as an example of one tire to explain the tire's load sensitivity, so understand the overall concept and do not be obsessed with the numbers. What was explained above can also be explained using the relationship between normal load, maximum lateral force, and lateral acceleration. When measuring the maximum lateral force while increasing the normal load, it can be seen that the maximum lateral force does not increase proportionally with the increase in normal load, but increases at a rate smaller than the increase rate of the normal load. As shown in the figure, delta F2 is the maximum increase in lateral force when the normal load increases by 1 kN, from 5 kN to 6 kN. Meanwhile, delta F1 is the maximum increase in lateral force that increases when the normal load increases by 1 kN, equally from 4 kN to 5 kN. As you can see, delta F2 is smaller than delta F1. Therefore, as the normal load increases, the maximum lateral force also increases, but it increases at a smaller rate than the increase rate of the normal load. Accordingly, the maximum lateral acceleration for normal load varies. Lateral acceleration is the friction coefficient multiplied by the gravitational acceleration. Therefore, as shown in the figure, when the normal load is 4 kN, the maximum lateral acceleration is 1.08 g, but this decreases to 0.99 g when the normal load is 5 kN, and to 0.9 g when the normal load is 6 kN. From what has been explained above, it can be seen that the larger the increase rate of the normal load, the smaller the increase rate of the maximum lateral acceleration that the tire can withstand. By looking at the relationship between normal load and friction coefficient, we can better understand the load sensitivity of tires. First, we can see that the friction coefficient decreases as the normal load increases. Second, it can be seen that the coefficient of friction decreases almost linearly as the normal load increases, at a rate similar to the increase rate of the normal load. As shown in the figure, when the normal load increases by 1 kN from 5 kN to 6 kN, the decrease in friction coefficient is delta mu2. Additionally, when the normal load increases by 1 kN from 4 kN to 5 kN, the decrease in friction coefficient is delta mu1. Delta mu2 is slightly larger than delta mu1, but has about the same values. Therefore, you can see that as the normal load increases at a certain rate, the coefficient of friction decreases at almost the same rate, although it is slightly larger. Let us explain what was explained above in terms of the weight distribution of the three vehicles using tire load sensitivity. The numbers shown above the vehicle represent weight distribution as a percentage. The first car on the left has the front wheels carrying 60% of the load and the rear wheels carrying 40% of the load. In this case, when cornering, the friction coefficient of the front wheels is small, so the front tires are pushed outward, causing understeer. The middle picture shows the same load acting on the front and rear wheels. In this case the vehicle tends to neutral steer. The last picture on the right shows the front wheels carrying 40% of the load and the rear wheels carrying 60% of the load. In this case, when cornering, the friction coefficient of the rear wheel is small, so the rear tire is pushed outward, causing oversteer. Due to the characteristics of these tires, a vehicle tends to understeer if the front wheel loads are heavy and oversteer if the rear wheel loads are heavy. The tire load sensitivity is very important in the suspension setup explained in the next video, so you need to understand it clearly. Let's look at how the height of the center of gravity affects the lateral forces of a turning vehicle and examine how we can apply the tire load sensitivity to predict the vehicle behavior. In the picture, there is a vehicle with a relatively low center of gravity, 1, and a vehicle with a relatively high center of gravity, 2. Depending on the height of the center of gravity, the size of the maximum lateral force varies when the vehicle drives on the bend at the same speed. Let's find out why. To find out the relationship between the center of gravity and lateral force, 
Let's analyze a vehicle with the same weight, but a relatively lower center of gravity, and a vehicle with a relatively higher center of gravity. From the previous normal load and lateral force results, we know that as the normal force increases, the amount of increase in lateral force relative to the increase in normal force becomes smaller and smaller. On the other hand, as the height of the center of gravity increases, the roll motion increases, and as the roll motion increases, the difference between the normal load between the inner and outer wheels increases when turning. Therefore, for vehicles of the same weight, a vehicle with a higher center of gravity, such as vehicle 2, has a lower maximum lateral force that can be withstood when turning compared to a vehicle with a lower center of gravity, such as vehicle 1. When a vehicle drives on a curved road, a centripetal force occurs. Centripetal force increases in proportion to the square of the speed. Therefore, in order for a vehicle to pass through a curved road section in the shortest possible time, it must have the conditions to maximize the lateral force that can withstand the centripetal force. What conditions must a vehicle have to produce the greatest lateral force it can withstand when turning? A car with ideal high performance driving conditions is one whose center of gravity is on the road surface and in the center of the left and right wheels. In those conditions, it can withstand the greatest lateral force when turning because the lateral force is maintained equally on the inner and outer wheels. However, it is practically impossible to have the center of gravity located on the road surface. However, we must not forget that the lower the center of gravity, the greater the maximum lateral force that can be withstood, which is advantageous. Let's look at the centripetal force. When a vehicle travels in a given circle at a constant speed, centripetal force is generated in the direction toward the center of the circle. And if the mass of the vehicle is m and the acceleration of gravity is g, the weight of the vehicle w is equal to mg as in the equation 1, and the magnitude of the centripetal force is equal to mv squared divided by the driving radius r, as shown in equation 2. On the other hand, the radial friction force f r can be expressed as the product of the friction coefficient mu and the normal load f z, as shown in equation 3. Next, we will look at tire friction coefficient and rollover criteria. Assuming that the entire vehicle is a rigid body and that the weight of the vehicle is evenly distributed on all four wheels, let's calculate the moment the right wheel lifts off the ground using the centripetal force. If the wheel tread is LT and the height of the center of gravity is H, the critical criteria that the right wheel falls off the ground can be calculated from the equation of moment equilibrium about the center of gravity, as shown in equation 4. Therefore, we can get the inequality equations. If the moment due to the normal load of the vehicle is greater than the moment due to the centripetal force, the vehicle may be stable or lateral sliding of the tires may occur depending on the friction coefficient as shown in the equation 5. In addition, if the moment due to the normal load of the vehicle is less than the moment due to the centripetal force, the behavior of the vehicle becomes unstable as in equation 6 and rollover occurs. Let's take a closer look at this case. Let's look at the relationship between friction force and sliding. As shown in equation 5, when the moment by centripetal force is less than the moment by normal load and the centripetal force Fp, E exceeds the maximum lateral friction force FFR, as shown in equation 7, sliding occurs and the vehicle is pushed outward. However, if the centripetal force FPE is less than the maximum frictional force FFR in the lateral direction, stable cornering is possible, as shown in equation 8. Let's look at the relationship between friction force and rollover. As shown in the figure, if the moment due to centripetal force FPE is greater than the moment due to normal load, rollover may start and the vehicle may roll over. This can be expressed as shown in equation 6. That is the reason for the caution in the previous video H0060 that when you first practice high performance driving, 
you should do so on roads with low friction coefficients. If the coefficient of friction is low, sliding occurs and high performance driving practice is possible, but if the coefficient of friction is high, the vehicle may roll over, so be careful. Let's review the changes in the friction circle discussed in the previous video. The friction circle is not fixed and continuously changes depending on driving conditions. When you brake while going straight, the normal load on the rear wheel decreases, so the friction circle on the rear wheel decreases. If the braking force is excessively large, the wheel locks and sliding occurs, the friction circle also decreases correspondingly. The final friction circle is the combination of these two results, resulting in a smaller friction circle, as shown in the fugger on the right. It is necessary to introduce a single track model to theoretically analyze the vehicle's turning behavior using tire load sensitivity. The single track model has the advantage of being easier to mathematically handle and easier to analyze the vehicle's behavior than modeling all four wheels. The single track model treats the two front wheels as one wheel and the two rear wheels as one wheel. Therefore, like a bicycle, it has one wheel each on the front and rear wheels, so it is also called a bicycle model. In the single track model, the front wheel steering angle is expressed as the average of the left and right wheel steering angles, as shown in the equation below. Using the single track model, you can express the front axle steering angle delta F as a function of the front and rear axle slip angles, vehicle speed, your rate, and wheelbase, and find the relationship between them to see how they are related to each other. Next, the forces and moments received by the vehicle during turning are analyzed, and the longitudinal acceleration, lateral acceleration, and your acceleration of the front and rear wheels are calculated as functions of the force components of the front and rear axles, the position of the center of gravity, and the mass moment of inertia, respectively. By solving this, we can get a good understanding of the contributions of these three accelerations. Lastly, let's look at how to determine oversteer and understeer by applying tire sensitivity from the equations for the vertical and lateral forces of the front and rear axles. Let's analyze the kinematics of the single track model to derive the relevant equations. Let us analyze the case where the vehicle turns with curvature radius rho. In the picture here, L represents the wheelbase, LF represents the longitudinal vertical distance from the center of gravity to the front axle, and LR represents the longitudinal vertical distance from the center of gravity to the rear axle. Alpha F and alpha R are the slip angles of the front and rear wheels, respectively, and beta is the side slip angle of the vehicle. The psi is the yaw angle and the psi dot is the yaw rate. In this case, the vehicle is turning at the angular velocity of the psi dot plus the beta dot. Therefore, the vehicle speed v can be expressed as equation 9 by multiplying the radius rho of the curvature by the angular velocity sum of psi dot and beta dot. Let's find the longitudinal speed of the single track model using the kinematics analyzed previously. In the case of a rigid body that makes a turning motion with the curvature radius rho, the acceleration that generates the centripetal force, y2 dot, can be obtained as in equation 10 using the velocity v in equation 9. Assuming the vehicle is a rigid body, the distance between all points on the vehicle must remain constant, regardless of any type of vehicle's motion. In this context, the x-direction component of the velocity of all points on the x-axis, which is the longitudinal axis passing through the vehicle's center of gravity, must all be the same. If the speeds are not the same, deformation occurs, so the setting that the vehicle is a rigid body is not correct. This can be expressed as equation 11. Next, let us express the equations for the front wheel slip angle alpha f and rear wheel slip angle alpha r using speed and steering angle. First, find the velocity of vf in the y direction. Since the vehicle is rotating, the speed of vf in the y direction must reflect the influence of the rotation of the vehicle's longitudinal axis, which is the yaw rate. 
The yaw direction component due to the vehicle's lateral slip angle is V times sine beta, and the yaw direction speed due to the vehicle's rotation is the yaw rate, psi dot multiplied by the vertical distance LF from the vehicle's center of gravity to the front wheel axle. Therefore, by adding these two, the y direction velocity component of VF can be obtained as shown in equation 12. Therefore, using the arc tangent angle from the geometric relationship, alpha F can be obtained as in equation 13. In the same way, alpha R can be obtained as equation 14. The preceding equations 13 and 14 can be simply expressed using trigonometric approximation equations in the case of small slip with a small angle beta. When the angle theta is small, the cosine theta is 1, and the sine theta and tangent theta have theta values. Therefore, the front wheel slip angle equation 13 and the rear wheel slip angle equation 14 can be expressed as equation 15 and equation 16, respectively, by eliminating all trigonometric terms. If you rearrange equations 15 and equation 16 obtained earlier in terms of beta and equate them to each other, you can get equation 17. As shown in equation 17, the front wheel steering angle delta F can be expressed as a function of front wheel slip angle alpha F, rear wheel slip angle alpha R, your rate psi dot, wheelbase L, and speed V. Next, to apply tire load sensitivity, we will analyze the forces and moments in the single track model. The lateral force FFY of the front wheels and the lateral force FRY of the rear wheels are perpendicular to the longitudinal wheel cross-section. The lines of action of the longitudinal force FFX on the front wheel and the longitudinal force FRX on the rear wheel coincide with the longitudinal section of the wheel. The force acting on the center of gravity includes forces due to lateral acceleration and longitudinal acceleration, and a force due to air resistance. It is assumed that air resistance acts only in the longitudinal direction of the vehicle and that the overall resultant force passes through the center of gravity. Also, during turning, a mass moment of inertia J Z psi 2 dot acts on the center of gravity. With these forces and moments, three equilibrium equations can be established for the longitudinal force, lateral force, and jet axis moment. First, let's find the longitudinal acceleration of the vehicle by establishing an equilibrium equation for the force in the x direction. The front wheel longitudinal component is F F X cosine delta F. The vehicle longitudinal component of the front wheel lateral force is F F Y sine delta F, which is negative because it is directed backwards. The air resistance force is F air. The vehicle longitudinal component of the force due to longitudinal acceleration is minus mx2 dot cosine beta, and the vehicle longitudinal component of force due to lateral acceleration is my2 dot sine beta. Finally, considering the longitudinal force FRx of the rear wheel, equation can be obtained. Here, if the angle delta F and beta are small, all trigonometric terms disappear and the longitudinal acceleration x2 dot can be simply expressed as equation b. This time, let's find the lateral acceleration by establishing an equilibrium equation for the force in the y direction. The vehicle lateral component of the front wheel longitudinal force is f f x sine delta f. The vehicle lateral component of the front wheel lateral force is f f y cosine delta f. The vehicle lateral component of the force due to longitudinal acceleration is mx2 dot sine beta, and the vehicle lateral component of force due to lateral acceleration is my2 dot cosine beta. Finally, considering the lateral force fry of the rear wheel, equation C can be obtained. Here, if angle delta f and beta are small, all trigonometric terms disappear and the longitudinal acceleration y2 dot can be simply expressed as equation d. Lastly, let's calculate the your acceleration by establishing the moment balance equation acting on the vehicle's center of gravity. 
Since the force passing through the center of gravity does not cause a moment about the center of gravity, F air, M Y2 dot, and M X2 dot are all excluded. F R X is also excluded because it passes through the center of gravity, and the vehicle longitudinal component of F F X is also excluded because it passes through the center of gravity. Let's set up the equilibrium equation with the remaining forces and moments. The vehicle lateral component of the front wheel longitudinal force is F F X sine delta F and the moment arm is L F so it can be expressed in the first term. The vehicle lateral component of the front wheel lateral force is F F Y cosine delta F and the moment arm is L F so it can be expressed as the second term. The lateral force of the rear wheel is F R Y, the moment arm length is L R, and since the direction of rotation is opposite, the sign is negative and can be expressed as the third item. Finally, the equilibrium equation is completed by expressing the vehicle's rotational moment of inertia J Z psi 2 dot. Here, if the angle delta F is small, all trigonometric terms disappear and the your acceleration, psi 2 dot, can be simply expressed as equation D. While load distribution according to the location of the center of gravity can be obtained using moment balance. Let the wheel base be L, the distance from the center of gravity to the center of the front wheel be LF, and the distance from the center of gravity to the center of the rear wheel be LR. Using the position of the center of gravity, the load F, Z, F applied to the front wheel is calculated as equation E. The load on the rear wheel F, Z, R can be obtained using equation F. Here, F, Z, F and F, Z, R represent the forces of the single track model, so they represent the normal load of the two front wheels and the normal load of the two rear wheels, respectively. Let's analyze the speed, angular velocity and angular acceleration when turning with a constant radius at a constant speed. Constant speed turning can be used to analyze the basic behavior of a turning vehicle using simple equations. If the vehicle speed is V, the yaw rate is psi dot, and the yaw acceleration is psi 2 dot, the turning speed of the vehicle is constant, so the vehicle speed and yaw rate are constant as shown in equations G and H, and the yaw acceleration is zero as shown in equation I because the yaw rate is constant and does not change. Therefore, the term multiplied by the mass moment of inertia J, Z, and your acceleration in equation C obtained previously becomes zero. Let's calculate the front and rear lateral force at a constant radius constant speed turn. In this case, the vehicle speed and your rate are constant and the your acceleration is zero, so let's use this to find the lateral force equation for the front and rear wheel. If the friction coefficient of the front wheel is mu f, the maximum friction force of the front wheel f f y max can be expressed by the equation j and the maximum friction force of the rear wheel f r y max can be expressed by the equation k. Meanwhile, the front wheel lateral force can be expressed by equation l using the distance from the center of gravity to the rear wheel, assuming that the inertial force in the opposite direction to the centripetal force is m y2 dot during turning with constant speed. Additionally, the rear wheel lateral force can be expressed by the equation m using the distance from the center of gravity to the front wheel. Additionally, a constant speed and constant radius turning vehicle must satisfy equation N because the your acceleration is zero in the equation D previously obtained. This time, we will find out the maximum lateral force during a constant speed and constant radius turn. By substituting the front wheel normal load of equation E into the front wheel maximum friction equation J, equation O can be obtained. Meanwhile, when the lateral acceleration is y2 dot, the lateral force of the front wheel can be expressed as equation L1 using the equation L obtained previously. When the lateral acceleration y2 dot increases and the lateral force ff y in equation L1 becomes equal to the ff y max in equation O, which is the maximum friction force, it is no longer possible to increase the lateral acceleration. Therefore, 
The maximum lateral acceleration that a vehicle can generate can be obtained as equation P by equating equation L1 and equation O. The maximum lateral acceleration of the rear wheel can be obtained using the same process as the front wheel using equation R. Once either the front or rear wheels reach the maximum lateral acceleration, no further increase in lateral acceleration is possible, so the maximum lateral acceleration of the vehicle has the lower value between the front and rear wheels and can be expressed as equation S. Using equation S, we can find out whether the vehicle tends to oversteer or understeer. Let's take a look at this. Let's look at the relationship between weight distribution and understeer during a constant speed and constant radius turn. We have previously looked at the tire load sensitivity. I explained that if the front and rear wheels are the same tire and the road surface is uniform, the friction coefficient of the tire will vary depending on the normal load. As shown in the graph, as the tire normal load increases, the friction coefficient decreases, and as the tire normal load decreases, the friction coefficient increases. Therefore, in equation S, the one with the greater load among the front or rear wheels has a smaller friction coefficient and therefore reaches the friction limit first. A relatively small coefficient of friction means that the available friction force is relatively small, so the heavier side is pushed out first when turning. In equations O and Q, if LR is greater than LF, the front wheel load is heavier than the rear wheel load, and the friction coefficient is smaller in the heavier one, so mu F is smaller than mu R. Therefore, as explained earlier, if you analyze by applying tire load sensitivity, you can see that the friction coefficient of the rear wheel, shown in blue, is large. During turning, the maximum lateral force is reached first at the front wheels, which have a lower coefficient of friction, so there is no available friction force at all, but the rear wheels still have extra friction. Therefore, the front wheels are pushed outward, resulting in understeer. This time, we will learn about the relationship between weight distribution and oversteer when the load on the rear wheels is greater than the load on the front wheels. In equations O and Q, if LR is less than LF, the rear wheel load is heavier than the front wheel load, and the friction coefficient is smaller in the heavier one, so mu R is smaller than mu F. Therefore, if you analyze by applying tire load sensitivity as explained earlier, you can see that the friction coefficient of the front wheel, shown in red, is large. During turning, the maximum lateral force reaches the rear wheels first, which have a lower coefficient of friction, so there is no available friction at all, but the front wheels still have available friction. Therefore, the rear wheels are pushed outward, resulting in oversteer. Let's look at vehicle behavior in understeer and how to overcome it. Understeer occurs when the front wheel slides sideways while turning. At this time, the front wheel driving state is located at pointer outside the red friction circle. On the other hand, the driving state of the rear wheels is point B, which has available friction force. When normal drivers find themselves in this situation, they turn the steering wheel more because the car does not go in the direction they want even if they steer. When this happens, as the tire slip angle becomes larger, the friction circle becomes smaller, as shown in the blue circle, making understeer even worse. Also, if you brake suddenly to stop the car quickly, the weight may shift significantly to the front, causing an unwanted sharp turn. From this analysis, we can learn how to overcome understeer. Let's understand how to overcome understeer using friction circles. You should loosen the steering wheel in the direction of travel of the vehicle, reduce the slip angle and wait for the grip of the rear tires to return. If the situation is urgent and you need to brake, do not brake suddenly, but repeat slight braking several times. If you are accelerating, you should slowly lift your foot off the accelerator pedal to avoid a large weight transfer to the front wheels. This increases the front wheel normal load, increasing the friction circle to the level of the green circle. Since the steering wheel is released, 
the lateral force is reduced and the braking force is added, so the driving state of the front wheel becomes green point D, and the corresponding friction circle at this time becomes larger and becomes a green circle. Therefore, steering is possible from the front wheels. Meanwhile, the normal load on the rear wheels is reduced due to braking, and the friction circle is reduced to red one. However, since the steering wheel is released, the lateral force is reduced, and the driving state of the rear wheels becomes red dot E, and the corresponding friction circle at this time becomes a red one. This time, we will learn about vehicle behavior in oversteer and how to overcome it. Oversteer occurs when lateral sliding occurs in the rear wheels while turning. At this time, the rear wheel drive state is located at point A, beyond the red friction circle. On the other hand, the driving state of the front wheels is point B, which has available friction force. When normal drivers find themselves in this situation, the rear of the vehicle slides to the left edge of the road even if they steer, so they turn the steering wheel more to the right to steer the vehicle to the right side of the road. When this happens, as the tire slip angle becomes larger, the friction circle becomes smaller, as shown in the blue circle, making oversteer even worse. From this analysis, we can learn how to overcome oversteer. Let's understand how to overcome oversteer through the relationship between oversteer and friction circles. Counter steering should be performed to reduce the slip angle by quickly turning the steering wheel to the left, the direction in which the vehicle is sliding, before the vehicle's drift angle becomes too large. The purpose of counter steering is to reduce the vehicle's turning moment. When the vehicle ends its turn after counter steering, the rear wheels regain grip very quickly and at this time, the counter-steering must be quickly released to return the vehicle to a straight-ahead state. On the other hand, if you counter-steering more aggressively than necessary, oversteer may occur when the grip of the rear tires is restored, so be careful. Secondary oversteer is more difficult to overcome. Also, in a front-wheel drive vehicle, if the situation is urgent and you need to accelerate to quickly regain rear-wheel grip, do not accelerate hard, but repeat slight acceleration several times. By slightly accelerating to increase the normal load on the rear wheels, the friction circle must be raised to the level of the green circle. Since the slip angle is reduced, the lateral force is reduced and the acceleration force is added, so the driving state of the rear wheel becomes green point D, and the corresponding friction circle at this time becomes a green circle. Meanwhile, the normal load on the front wheel decreases due to acceleration, and the friction circle is reduced to red one, but the slip angle is reduced, so the lateral force decreases, and the driving state of the front wheel becomes red dot E, and the corresponding friction circle at this time is a red circle. Therefore, steering is possible from the front wheels. In a rear-wheel drive car, you should not accelerate while oversteer is in progress because oversteer will increase. Let's consider understeer using a graph showing the relationship between lateral force and slip angle. As shown in the picture, when turning, if the maximum lateral force of the front wheels exceeds the maximum lateral force of the rear wheels, the vehicle will not be able to turn as much as the driver expects, even if the steering is performed. On the other hand, the rear wheel still has enough friction potential. Accordingly, the force of the FS that deviates from the front wheel friction circle generates understeer, so even when the driver rotates the steering wheel, the vehicle does not rotate as much as the driver operates the steering wheel. Let's find out how to overcome understeer. First, by reducing the steering angle, lateral forces and slip angles are reduced and friction potential is secured. Reducing the steering angle returns the driving state from pointer to Q. Here, one thing to note is that if the steering angle is increased at the maximum lateral force state, the slip angle increases, so the driving state deviates from the friction circle and steering becomes impossible. If you were on the acceleration, take your foot off the accelerator pedal and confirm if front tire grip has recovered. 
If the front wheel grip is still not restored and sliding continues, step on the brake pedal slightly several times to transfer the weight from the rear wheel to the front wheel. As a result, the friction force potential increases as the slip angle decreases, and the friction force potential further increases as the normal load due to braking increases at the front wheels, so the final friction circle becomes a blue dashed circle. The driving state at this time becomes point Q. Therefore, front wheel steering becomes possible. Next, let's consider oversteer using a graph of lateral force and slip angle. As shown in the picture, when turning, if the rear wheels exceed the maximum lateral force before the front wheels, the rear wheels will be pushed outward, causing the vehicle to turn more than the driver expected. Accordingly, the driving condition of the rear wheels causes oversteer due to the force FS being outside the rear wheel friction circle, pushing the rear wheels outward in the direction of turning. On the other hand, the front wheels still have enough friction potential. Let's find out how to overcome oversteer. By reducing the yaw motion with fast counter steer, the lateral force and slip angle of the front and rear wheels are reduced securing the friction potential at the front wheels and recovering the friction potential at the rear wheels. Counter steer must not be slow. This must be done as quickly as possible. Here, one thing to note is that if the steering angle is increased at the maximum lateral force state, the slip angle increases, so the driving state goes beyond the friction circle and the steering becomes impossible. Another thing to note is that the friction potential recovers quickly, so the moment it recovers, the counter-steer steering angle must be quickly unwound to the vehicle's direction of travel. In the case of front-wheel drive, step on the accelerator pedal slightly, several times, to transfer weight from the front wheel to the rear wheel and secure friction in the rear wheel. In case of rear-wheel drive, take your foot off the accelerator pedal and restore rear-wheel friction. Using this driving technique, the friction potential becomes larger due to a decrease in the slip angle of the front wheel, and the normal load on the rear wheel increases due to acceleration, which increases the friction potential of the rear wheel, and the final friction circle becomes a black dashed circle. The driving state at this time becomes the point Q. Therefore, front wheel steering is still possible and the rear wheels are stabilized. While the vehicle is oversteering, if the front wheels are steered in the direction the vehicle should travel, the steering wheel naturally rotates in the opposite direction to the direction the road is curved. It is called opposite lock or counter steer. The purpose of counter steer is to restore tire friction potential and vehicle stability. Corresponding to these two purposes, physically, the counter steer does two things. First, by reducing the slip angle, the friction potential is secured. As shown in the figure on the right, if the slip angle in the operating state S is reduced to the slip angle in the operating state T, the friction potential can be secured as shown on the friction circle in the left figure. The secondary purpose of counter steer is to create a counter swing motion in the vehicle thus suppressing the vehicle's pendulum motion. When the rear wheel is pushed outward, pendulum movement occurs as shown in the picture on the left, resulting in your motion. At the beginning when this condition begins to occur, if you counter steer quickly, a counter swing motion will occur in the vehicle as shown in the picture on the right, reducing the yaw motion of the vehicle and improving vehicle stability. Let's look at the engine map. In high-performance driving, the maximum output of the engine must be used to achieve the maximum acceleration and, as a result, reduce lap time which is driving time. First, let's understand the engine map. This figure shows engine torque and engine power in one figure. Maximum torque is the engine RPM at which the engine torque is maximized, and maximum power is the engine RPM at which the engine power is maximized. Expressing RPM in revolutions per second is equivalent to equation 18, and expressing it again in radians per second gives equation 19. 
The interval between maximum torque RPM and maximum power RPM is called power band. In high performance driving, a maximum acceleration can be achieved and acceleration spin can be easily generated only when the engine is operated in the power band. Multiplying the torque by the angular velocity omega in equation 20, the power can be calculated as in equation 21. In this figure, the RPM that can produce maximum power is about 5200, but in reality, when accelerating from 5200, as RPM continues to increase, the power decreases and exceeds the engine red line, so you have to shift to a higher gear. This is undesirable as it takes time to shift again. Therefore, it is necessary to use RPM within the power band suitable for the driving course. Dropping the engine RPM below the power band is also undesirable in high performance driving. This is because it takes extra time to get the engine RPM up to the power band and it has to go through the RPM range of turbo lag. Therefore, in high performance driving, the engine speed must always be kept within the power band. A driving method that maintains this is left foot braking. Braking with your left foot is called left foot braking usually used when there is no clutch pedal. In left braking, your left foot is dedicated to braking and your right foot is dedicated to acceleration. This allows each foot to specialize in its role, controlling the brake and accelerator pedals to create more precisely sized braking and acceleration forces. It takes a lot of training to generate an accurate braking force with the left foot. To the extent that your right foot can accurately control your acceleration, your left foot should be able to control the braking force as well. For precise control of the brake pedal, the brake pedal may be modified to have the same pedal stroke as the accelerator pedal by increasing the pedal stroke. If you use your right foot to control both the brake and accelerator pedals without moving your left foot, your right foot has to keep moving between the brake and accelerator pedals, which takes time. However, with left foot braking, each foot controls the brake and accelerator pedals separately, reducing the time it takes to travel between the two pedals with one foot. Also, since you keep stepping on the accelerator pedal with your right foot, you can always keep the engine RPM within the power band, and accordingly, Engine power can always be used without going through the turbo lag section that appears when accelerating from idle RPM. In addition, since each foot is continuously attached to the pedal in charge of each, it is possible to prevent impact weight transfer caused by sudden release of the pedal when switching from braking to acceleration, or from acceleration to braking and enables smooth weight transfer. In addition, when turning, it is possible to minimize roll motion and pitching motion by generating rear wheel sliding or spin using smooth weight transfer. The last advantage is that you can accelerate and brake at the same time. Accelerating and braking at the same time may seem useless at first glance, but it is a very useful skill in high performance driving. For example, when accelerating and braking at the same time in a front wheel drive vehicle, the rear wheels can be locked and slide because only the braking force is applied, while the front wheels act simultaneously with the braking force and the acceleration force, so the forces of each other are balanced to create a free rolling state. In this way, the friction circle of the front wheels increases, consequently, the degree of freedom of driving is increases. Rear-wheel drive or four-wheel drive vehicles can also use this technology when a weight shift is required while reducing speed, as well. However, recently released cars are equipped with a brake override system to protect the driver and the vehicle's powertrain from misuse by customers. In case the driver presses both the accelerator pedal and the brake pedal at the same time, Automobile companies have developed the BOS or brake override system and all recently released cars are equipped with BOS. In BOS, when the driver presses both the brake pedal and the accelerator pedal at the same time, the ECU detects this, reduces fuel supply to the engine and prioritizes braking 
so that only braking force is generated. Normally, when the accelerator and brake pedals are pressed simultaneously for more than 0.5 seconds, the accelerator pedal angle is greater than the specified value, and the vehicle speed is greater than 8 km per hour. The ECU activates BOS to reduce the fuel supply. Depending on the manufacturer, in some models the BOS is disabled while turning. In this case, BOS does not work even if the brake pedal is pressed for more than 0.5 seconds. Let's look at heel and toe shifting. The heel and toe driving technique is used in vehicles with a clutch pedal. Like normal driving, the left foot is used exclusively for the clutch, but the toe of the right foot is used to control the brake pedal and the lateral heel of the right foot is used to control the accelerator pedal. Since you have to control the two pedals with your right foot, you need to wear driving shoes with thin soles and practice for a long time while feeling the sensation of the soles of your feet before you can drive satisfactorily. The purpose of the heel and toe driving technique is the same as steps 2 to 4 of the left foot brake driving technique described above. Some race car drivers use both feet freely as shown in the picture. Driving maneuvers like this are only possible when the body's muscles have been trained with a lot of training and automatically respond to road conditions. Otherwise, serious accidents may occur, so it is not recommended to use it. The figure here describes the sliding phenomenon determined by the relationship between the braking force of the vehicle's brake system and the friction coefficient. For convenience of description from now on, all torques and forces are absolute values unless otherwise specified. The braking force of the front wheel brake system FEQ can be expressed as equation 22 by dividing the braking torque TB by the tire effective radius R. On the other hand, the braking friction force is the product of the front wheel normal force WF and the friction coefficient mu, so it can be expressed as in equation 23. When the braking friction force is less than the front wheel braking force to prevent the wheel from rotating, sliding occurs, so you can get equation 24. So, as we guessed, sliding occurs easily when the coefficient of friction is low. When you first start high performance driving, it is recommended to start on low friction surfaces that slide and spin easily. The figure here describes the sliding phenomenon determined by the relationship between the vehicle's engine traction force and the friction coefficient. The engine traction force FAC can be expressed as equation 25 by dividing the acceleration torque TA by the tire effective radius R. On the other hand, the friction force at front wheels is the product of the front wheel normal force WF and the friction coefficient mu so it can be expressed as in equation 26. Spin occurs when the friction force is less than the engine traction force and the wheel spin on the road surface. Thus, equations 27 can be obtained. So, as we guessed, spin easily occurs when the coefficient of friction is low. Therefore, when you first start high performance driving, it is recommended to start on low friction surfaces that slide and spin easily. The figure here shows the vehicle's pitching motion as a function of the friction coefficient and weight transfer during braking. If the friction coefficient is small, as shown in equation 28, the braking friction force is low, so the tire cannot grip the ground, so sliding occurs and the wheel slides in a locked state. When the friction coefficient is small, the pitching motion is small. When the friction coefficient is large, the braking friction force is large, so the tire can grip the ground, so no sliding occurs, and the pitching motion is large. The picture here is exaggerated to aid understanding. The figure here shows the vehicle's pitching motion as a function of the friction coefficient and weight transfer during acceleration. If the coefficient of friction is small, as shown in equation 29, the acceleration friction force is low. So the tires do not grip the ground, so a spin occurs and the vehicle does not move, and the wheels rotate in place. When the friction coefficient is small, the pitching motion is small. If the friction coefficient is large, the acceleration friction force is large, 
so the tire can grip the ground, so no sliding occurs, and the pitching motion is large. The picture here is exaggerated to aid understanding. The figure here shows the maximum roll motion of the vehicle during a turn, depending on the weight transfer and side force coefficient. If the side force coefficient is small, as shown in equation 30, the friction force is lowered and the tires cannot grip the ground, causing lateral sliding and pushing the vehicle outward. If the side force coefficient is small, the magnitude of roll motion is small. When the side force coefficient is large, the friction force increases and the tire can grip the ground, preventing sliding and increasing roll motion. If the roll motion increases, rollover may occur, so be careful. The figure here is exaggerated to aid understanding. Let's learn about the attitude angle when there is no rear wheel sliding. When the vehicle turns the steering wheel by the angle delta, the vehicle turns. As a result, your motion occurs and tire side slip occurs across all tires, causing the vehicle to move not in the direction of the steering angle but in a direction with an angle other than the steering angle relative to the vehicle's reference axis. At this time, the angle between the reference axis and the direction in which the vehicle moves at a speed of V is denoted as beta, and this angle beta is called the vehicle side slip angle or attitude angle. In a typical low speed left turn where lateral sliding of the rear wheel does not occur, the attitude angle occurs less than the steering angle. In vehicle dynamics analysis, the angular velocities of the yaw angle and attitude angle are important, and the details of these angular velocities will be explained in the next video. Let's learn about the attitude angle when there is rear wheel sliding. If sliding occurs at the rear wheel due to left foot braking or handbraking, the friction circle of the rear wheel decreases. The rear wheels of the vehicle rotate counterclockwise relative to the front wheels. At this time, unlike the previous low speed turn, in the high speed turn using left foot braking, as the yaw angular velocity increases, the yaw angle occurs counterclockwise, but the attitude angle occurs clockwise, as shown in the figure. Accordingly, the energy that generates roll motion is eliminated with the friction energy of tire sliding and the vehicle's posture is rotated in advance in the desired direction, allowing the vehicle to quickly exit sharp curves. As explained earlier, this method of driving using rear wheel sliding should be limited to when the road surface friction coefficient is low. Let's take a look at each change in attitude with and without rear wheel sliding. The picture here shows the change in vehicle posture between normal and high performance driving in a sharp left turn. In normal driving, the attitude angle starts at zero before entering a sharp turn, is maintained at approximately 3 degrees counterclockwise during the sharp turn, and becomes zero again after passing the sharp turn. In high performance driving, the attitude angle starts at zero before entering a sharp turn, is maintained at approximately 40 degrees clockwise during the sharp turn, and becomes zero again after passing the sharp turn. If you look at positions 2 and 3 in high performance driving, you can see that the vehicle attitude is already aligned, close to the target direction you want to proceed. Compare positions 2 and 3 in normal driving. Again, the method of driving using rear wheel sliding should be limited to when the road surface friction coefficient is low. Driving methods should vary depending on road conditions. Car racing can be divided into racing, where the road surface friction coefficient is large, and rallying, where the road surface friction coefficient is small. I'll explain each of these in detail later, but here we'll first look at the big picture of why driving on curved roads needs to be different. Racing drives on roads with a high friction coefficient suppresses sliding and spinning on curved roads as much as possible, and reduces speed to pass. On the other hand, in rallying, the road surface friction coefficient is small, causing sliding or spin to pass through the curved road. Let's find out the reasons for this. Let's first look at racing, which has a high coefficient of friction on the road surface. 
If oversteer due to lateral sliding occurs to a large extent on a road surface with a high friction coefficient, there is a high probability that an accident will occur due to the large lateral force. The lateral force in Formula 1 generates a lateral acceleration of up to 5 g. Even if the oversteer caused by rear-wheel lateral sliding that occurs at this time is overcome by counter-steer, it will take more time to pass compared to driving without sliding. The most serious problem is sliding due to rear-wheel locking in a front-wheel drive car, which causes flat spot wear on the tires. Additionally, rear-wheel spin in a rear-wheel drive car causes graining in the tires. Flat spots cause unbalanced vibration of the tires, and the resulting vibration and noise seriously interferes with the driver's road feel, making racing no longer possible. In car races where the road surface friction coefficient is high, lateral sliding due to drive wheel spin or rear wheel locking must never occur to a large extent. On the other hand, on a road surface with a low coefficient of friction, spins or sliding can easily occur, and drivers can easily control them. Because the coefficient of friction is low, the tires experience relatively less wear. Rally cars generally have a high center of gravity, so there is a risk of rollover during sharp turns. In this case, if the rear wheel slides laterally, you can pass the curve without causing a rollover. The figure here represents the driving trajectory of a rear wheel drive racing car. Depending on the driving technique through curved roads, the vehicle's trajectory can vary, which will be explained in the next video. What I want to explain here is that the driving trajectory of the race car does not cause rear wheel sliding to a large extent. This means that the driving is performed under the maximum lateral force on the circumference of the friction circle. Point B on the circumference of the green friction circle represents the driving state of the racing car in this figure, as it travels along a circumference with a constant radius. This time, we will look at the driving route of rally vehicle. The figure here shows the driving trajectory of a rear-wheel drive rally vehicle. Details for each section of the curved road will be explained in the next video. What I want to explain here is that the driving trajectory of rally vehicle causes lateral sliding to a large extent. This means that it is operated under the maximum lateral force on the reduced friction circle. The friction circle was originally a green circle, but was reduced to a red circle due to rear wheel spin and side sliding. Point B, outside the red friction circle indicates a driving state in which rear wheel spin occurs due to slight rear wheel acceleration while the lateral force is maximum. Here, point B of the friction circle represents the driving state when the rally vehicle enters the sharp turn section. Let's find the answer to the quiz. Which of the following statements about left foot braking is not correct? The answer is number 5, there is no negative effect on the powertrain system at all. Let's summarize the contents. From the purpose of high performance driving to the principle of the friction circle, part 1 of video number H0060 explains. Weight transfer and friction circle are also explained. The principles of spin and sliding are explained in part 2 of video number 0061. In the same video, I also explained inertia, momentum and energy. In this video part 3, I explained the principle of centripetal force. If the roll moment due to the vehicle's normal load is greater than the roll moment due to the centripetal force, the vehicle is stable. If the centripetal force exceeds the maximum radial friction force, sliding occurs, pushing the vehicle outward. If the roll moment due to the vehicle's normal load is less than the roll moment due to centripetal force, the vehicle is unstable. Rollover may occur, and the vehicle may overturn. Regarding weight distribution and lateral force, the normal load on the front and rear wheels is different, so the size of the friction circle and the maximum lateral force are different. The normal load varies depending on the distance from the center of gravity to the front and rear axles.
As the vertical load increases, the coefficient of friction decreases. The absolute value of the friction coefficient reduction rate is greater than the vertical load increase rate. Understeer and oversteer must be judged by considering suspension setup, type of drivetrain and driving condition. On the way to overcome understeer by reducing the steering angle, thereby reduce the lateral force and slip angle and securing available friction force and by stepping on the brake pedal slightly and frequently, increase the weight on the front wheels to secure friction potential. On the way to overcome oversteer, counter steering quickly to reduce the lateral force and slip angle of the front and rear wheels. In front wheel drive, step on the accelerator pedal slightly and frequently to create the friction potential for the rear wheels with the increased weight. In rear wheel drive, gently take your foot off the accelerator pedal and wait until rear wheel traction is restored. The moment tire friction is restored, quickly return the steering wheel to the straight ahead direction. The effect of counter steer is to reduce the slip angle to secure extra friction and to produces a counter swing motion in the vehicle and suppresses the vehicle's pendulum movement. Regarding the engine map, the power band section must be used to enable a large amount of vehicle acceleration. Engine speed must always be maintained within the power band. The advantage of left foot braking is that accuracy is increased by dividing the rolls between both feet. Since your left foot is dedicated to braking and your right foot is dedicated to accelerating, you can eliminate the time your right foot has to go back and forth between the brake and accelerator pedals. The time it takes to raise engine RPM can be shortened. It is possible to accelerate the vehicle by avoiding the turbo lag range. Smooth weight transfer is possible. You can accelerate and brake at the same time. Regarding coefficient of friction and pitching and roll motion, the lower the coefficient of friction, the easier it is to spin. A high coefficient of friction prevents sliding and increases pitching and roll motion. Driving using rear wheel sliding should be limited to when the road surface friction coefficient is low. If you watch the previous videos, you can easily understand upcoming videos. In video number H0060 of High Performance Driving Volume 1, which is Principle and Theory Part 1, I explained the purpose of high performance driving, the principle of weight transfer, and the principle of the friction circle and ellipse. Recently, in video number H0061 of High Performance Driving Volume 2, which is Principle and Theory Part 2, I explained angular momentum and finally energy conservation law. The next video is part 4 of high performance driving. I will explain the principles of left foot braking, how to use the pedals, how to feel the vehicle, and the procedures for high performance driving. Please hit the thumbs up and catch the brand new videos by free subscription, so what are you waiting for? See you at next videos. Goodbye guys.